Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. We begin tonight in Montreal. Here is our reporter correspondent, Lindsay, Lindsay Richardson, to tell us what she has on tap for this week. We thought the pandemic was ending when Quebec lifted most of its heavy handed measures back in mid March. But in today's government COVID update, the province says that hospitalization numbers and case numbers are on the rise. So we're wondering, while the rest of the general population is venturing out, how is the situation impacting people who are confined to much closer quarters? A lawyer recently reached out to us in concern for a few clients detained at Bordeaux Jail, a minimum security facility on the island of Montreal. She says when Quebec lifted its restrictions last month, vulnerable clients serving intermittent or weekend sentences at home were ordered to start serving time in prison again. We spoke to one of these clients, Mohawk man who does not want to be named. He claims dozens of inmates share a common space, are not given masks or access to soap and water. He also claims they're given one meal a day. We reached out to Quebec's public security ministry and they gave us a list of rigid hygiene protocols they say are in place at Bordeaux. The thing is, the allegations we've heard are hard to prove from here on the outside, so we're looking to speak to somebody who can put this situation into broader context. I'll have more on that coming up on APTN National News. All right, thanks for that, Lindsay. And here's uh, APTN's Atlantic Region reporter, Angel Moore, to tell us what she is working on this week. We have been hearing a lot about the settlement for 60 Scoop survivors. Last week, it was announced the payouts for individual survivors would be capped at $25,000. Colleen Cardinal, a 60 Scoops adoptee, spoke to APTN News and said it's another trigger for those who have lost their cultural identity, and a public apology would help survivors heal. The settlement provides $500 to $750 million in compensation, and $50 million for a foundation and healing fund. One survivor, Darlene Gilbert, says the $50 million for the healing fund is peanuts after so many lost their culture and language. Gilbert was 12 years old when she was taken. She was placed in a hospital, a Catholic foster home, the Nova Scotia School for Colored Children, and numerous group homes. Gilbert says more needs to be done to help survivors heal. Join me later as Gilbert takes APTN News to her healing place. All right, thanks for that, Angel. And now north to our Iqaluit Bureau, where we are joined by Kent Driscoll. Kent, I understand you got to sit down and have a conversation with one of our Winnipeg area MPs. Did somebody get lost? Thanks, and no, no one got lost. This was a Winnipeg MP who has a legitimate reason to be in Iqaluit. It was Northern Affairs Minister Dan Vandell who I had a chance to sit down with. Now, he was in town touting the contents of the federal budget, and there was a lot of housing in the federal budget. There is no more important need in Nunavut than housing. Now, according to the Nunavut Housing Corporation, they would need $1 billion. That's billion with a B. Just to get caught up with the current housing demand here in the territory, Government of Nunavut, they're going to be receiving $60 million over two years for housing. And then on top of that, there's another $845 million over seven years for all Inuit housing. And that covers much more than Nunavut. Here's a bit of our conversation with Van Dal. When I asked if that offered money was anywhere enough to meet the demand. Is 60 mil over two years enough to help Nunavut? 60 million over two years is a down payment from Northern Affairs uh, so to the territorial government so that the territory uh, can use that money, which has very few conditions, in the best way possible so that the territory can lever other money, whether it's private or whether it's other public money. Now, we spent much of our time on housing because housing could easily be categorized as the first, second, and third most important issue here in the territory. Every other problem gets worse with bad housing. Now, we also touched on resource extraction, namely mining. The budget has $1.5 billion in it for what they call critical minerals. And the money is to help take away some of the risk for investors. We wanted to know about the risk for Nunavumiut. Nunavumiut wants some resource extraction, but not at the expense of the land. I wanted to know 
How do you go about striking the balance between the two? Of course, there's going to be lots of consultations with, uh, with residents of the territory, people on the ground, uh, the industry, of course, and uh, we know how, how important uh, critical minerals are and will be to the future of, of the world. It was a pretty wide-ranging conversation. We even got into some of the challenges an English speaker faces when trying to pronounce Inuktitut terms. Now, no spoilers, but I think the minister's pronunciation is improving. His kivalik, that's pretty sharp. And uh, we'll be bringing you a lot more of this conversation very soon here on APTN National News. Back to you in Winnipeg. All right, thanks for that, Ken. Certainly look forward to that. We need to step aside for a short break, but plenty more stories are coming up. Welcome back. The opioid crisis is getting worse with record over overdose deaths across the country. In the Yukon this February, the crisis claimed at least eight lives. Now Yukoners are calling on the, the territorial government, excuse me, to do more to save lives. Here's Sarah Connors with that story. Like you walk into somewhere and she'd be the one to make everybody laugh. <laughs> 34-year-old Miranda Charlie loved hockey and was an accomplished hockey player. The Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation citizen left her community of Old Crow in northern Yukon as a teenager to play hockey for Team Yukon. She wanted to play hockey, so she, she did, and she did pretty good. She continued to be involved with her community where she helped with youth recreation. She also took pride in joining the Junior Rangers and later joined the Canadian Rangers alongside her father, Douglas. All I think about is my sister and, you know, she was such a good person. Charlie's younger sister, Chantel Tija, remembers her as a role model to her younger siblings. Just always there for people and... Just a lot of people loved her and for the person she was. But Charlie struggled with addictions. Tija says last fall, their father died from cancer, which her sister struggled to cope with. Things just got worse for all of us, especially my older sister. But yeah, it was just, um, it was just too hard to quit, I guess. On January 19th, Charlie died from a lethal dose of cocaine mixed with fentanyl and benzodiazepine at the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter. Tija says her sister's death from opioids has been devastating. Miranda was a big part of my life after that, losing our dad. And I feel like I got nobody now, but it's... Um, it's very hard. According to Yukon's chief coroner, eight people died in the territory from illicit drug use between January 3rd to January 24th, which is over a third of all of last year's opioid deaths. Tisha says she doesn't want another family to experience the pain of losing a loved one to opioids. That's why she's speaking out. Not only speaking for my sister, but for everybody else that lost someone in the Yukon right now, it's hard. We lost so many people, and we need to put an end to this somehow. It is time to rally around our communities, our friends, our neighbours, and our family members who need our support. Last month, Yukon's health minister, Tracy Ann McPhee, declared a substance use health emergency. It does not grant the government any additional powers or privileges. But McPhee says her government is committing to tackling the substance use crisis. It um, expresses a commitment of our government um, as a priority for government action. Well, basically, she announced the emergency, and that's about it. it it's an empty, it's an empty announcement. Billy Hebschelin is a recovering addict who lives in Whitehorse. The Carcross Tagish First Nation citizen has been clean for 13 years with the help of a treatment center he attended in BC. He says the Yukon is lacking in treatment options and adequate aftercare. And the biggest problem here, you know, I see is people are getting sent out to treatment. They're coming back and we have no aftercare plan, period, for them. There's none. 
when I first got clean and when I first come home from getting clean, there was no, there was one Narcotics Anonymous meeting. And I started one for Wednesdays. And now I think there's three. And he says that lack of aftercare has devastating consequences. You know, I got a cousin now that, you know, she was in treatment and then she come back. There was no aftercare program and, you know, now she's uh, passed away too because of addictions. McPhee agrees more needs to be done and says her department is working on improving services. I think a coordinated aftercare uh, program that would be available uh, either in communities or in a way that people could connect through communities is absolutely critical. But no new aftercare programming has been announced yet. All this stuff that they're coming up with now should have been done a long time ago. Chantel Tija says solutions are needed now more than ever so more families won't be impacted. I just hope like they get the drugs off the streets and put an end to all this hurt and pain. I don't know how much more it could take. <laughs> now she's honoring her sister by encouraging anyone struggling to reach out and get help. But we need to realize, like, we need the help to get through this and looking for healthy ways to get through it. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. And in B.C., many people with addictions have been struggling for a long time. We brought you the story of Faith Alexis in 2019, more than two years ago. In February this year, she was trying to survive the streets of Vancouver's downtown east side while fighting addictions. And a warning, this story may be disturbing to some viewers. Faith Rose Alexis was born on March the 8th, 1982, in Bella Coola, B.C. Her mother, Mavis Benson, was just 16 years old at the time. Being really young and naive, I, I just didn't know what I, what I was in for, you know. And after the labor, I was just so exhausted. And she was a beautiful little baby. And, you know, I just totally fell in love with her when she was born. Soon after Faith was born, Mavis became a single mom and moved back to their community, the Cheslata First Nation, near Burns Lake, B.C. Faith's grandparents helped raise her while Mavis finished school. It was the stability in Faith's young life that she yearned for, and she thrived as she learned about her culture. Her mom says Faith wanted to become a movie star and a model. She was excited for her future. In 2002, she even attended the American Indian Film Festival in San Francisco, California to pursue her goals. And then she wanted to go to Hawaii to see the world. She was a beautiful girl. She was always energetic and full of life and she just loved life. She used to do everything that she could. She was just excited for life every single day. Nearly unrecognizable, we met Faith in 2019. She was then 38 years old and living in Vancouver's downtown east side since 2008. Severely addicted to drugs, she lives in a single room occupancy room on Vancouver's East Hastings Street. Her mom Mavis says it all started when she got into pills and alcohol when she was about 16 when they moved to Vancouver. In her early 20s, she got sober and had four children. She left the father of her children because she claims he was abusive. She tried hard to raise her kids on her own, but Mavis says she suffered from postpartum depression. So Mavis took custody of three of her grandkids while the youngest was adopted. And then Mavis says Faith's world turned upside down when her beloved grandmother Mary passed away. When her grandma passed away, her, her world was taken from her. Mavis agreed to wear a GoPro camera for this story, and hours into her search, she finds Faith on East Hastings Street, outside of the SRO where she lives. Hi, Faith. Hi. Oh, Mom, is that you? Yes. Oh, hi, Mom. Hi, baby. Hi. Faith says she has just returned from the hospital and claims that she was tested for COVID-19. However, she was discharged even though she has gaping open wounds on both her arms and hands. How come they didn't even look at your arms and wrap your arms? No, I know, I know, I know. But they didn't anyway. They discharged me. They told me they made my pockets worth to come back. 
You sound pretty bad. Yeah. Faith is just one of the thousands of people who are living in poverty. And down here, addiction is just a way of life. And back in 2019, she agreed to be filmed to show the reality of what it's like living in places like this. For Faith, years of addiction and not taking care of herself has resulted in poor health and a weak immune system, making her a perfect target for COVID-19. This is Faith's room. It's infested with bed bugs and cockroaches and piles of garbage and clothes. The shower is totally filled with clothes and debris, making it unusable. Look at that, oh my goodness. Admittedly heavily addicted to drugs and dealing with mental illness, every day it's the same, finding drugs and doing drugs. Two years after this story was filmed, we ran into Faith on East Tasting Street. So, do you want to get sober, Faith? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, yes. Yeah. Do you need help to do that? Uh, yes, I do. I need help to get into recovery. Um, I need to go in first. I need to go into the hospital. I need to go into the hospital. I need to check in. I need to um, get my arms finished, um, search so they can get get some healing. You know, I need to get some sobriety. I can't wait till the day I become sober and I don't deal with addictions anymore. Yeah. What, yeah, do, you, what yeah. do you want other kids to know about the life down here? It's really hard. Like it's really brutally hard. Like you can even see like the way people walk and they're walking and they've been down here for years and years and years and years and years. And you don't ever want to end up like that. You don't ever want to end up on a road where you're broke. You don't want to ever become a drug addict. What do you want to say about your children? Um, I love them very much and I miss them so dearly and I can't wait to be home with them and I can't wait to be sober. Shortly after this interview, Faith was admitted to the hospital and is now awaiting treatment. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. And Tina House says that Faith is now in a treatment program. We need to take one final break, but still to come, we'll get an inside look at a Cree and Ojibwe program at a Winnipeg school. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Aurora Farms in southern Manitoba welcomed four new baby-born goats. Turns out two of them are fans of the Winnipeg Jets, and their mom, Helly, is also named after Jets goalie Connor Hellebuck. Our very own Melissa Ridgen was there when the kids were first welcomed into the world last weekend. Send your photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. It's been over five years since the Winnipeg School Division's Isaac Brock School first started their Cree and Ojibwe program. We got an inside look and to check in on the progress they've made since then. If you find yourself in the halls of Isaac Brock School in Winnipeg, there's a good chance you'll hear Cree and Ojibwe being spoken. The school has offered Cree and Ojibwe bilingual programs starting in kindergarten since 2016. They understand why they need to learn language because of what happened, you know, the generation before about residential schools and their ancestors were not allowed to speak their language and this is their their time, their opportunity to be learning what their ancestors wanted them to to carry with them. In the kindergarten program, students are fully immersed in either the Cree or Ojibwe languages. Grade 1 and up is bilingual with 50% of instruction in either Cree or Ojibwe and 50% in English. Some don't realize like what, what community that they come from. It's, um, and that's very important to learn because if you, they know their history because they're, it's been said many times if you don't know your history, you don't know where you're going. So this way they have an idea, their path of where they're going to, to learn their, their way of life, their traditions, culture, their language. One issue that the current teachers see is finding more instructors to teach the languages. It's not out there as much. It's not advertised as much as it should be. And, but that's the... The challenges that we have is that finding 
language speakers that are fluent in a language. That's the challenges that we have in, uh, in offering these Aboriginal language of the Korean Ojibwe program. Like I know many language speakers, but a lot of language speakers are very attached to their home communities. And so, you know, I understand that, you know, it's, they want to be connected to the land and it's not the same being in the city. But I encourage people, if they have a passion for teaching and, you know, doing something for the next generation of Indigenous students and Indigenous peoples, then yeah, if you can do it, become a teacher. You know, it's very rewarding. Aishin says being able to see and hear the students learn and grow is a feeling like no other. Just hearing them being able to recall new vocabulary words when I'm asking them, you know, the next day, the following day, do you remember how we say this? Or, and then they can recall it. And then that, that's very rewarding. So I know um, that I'm doing something special. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. While APTN Investigates is back tomorrow night with part two of John Murray's episode, here he is with a sneak peek. Just last fall, the province of Alberta released a report looking at establishing a provincial police force, saying the new force would cost more, but would provide better service. It's a plan that would take six years and have a half a billion dollar startup tag. Just last week, Alberta municipalities rejected that plan. Will First Nations? Earlier this year, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruled that First Nations policing program is discriminatory in its funding because the Innu community of Mastuayash cannot provide policing services equivalent to other non-Indigenous communities. Alberta also has three Indigenous police departments located on First Nations. The Kainai Nation, or Blood Tribe, has a police force on the largest reserve in Alberta. Then there's the Sutina Police Department just outside Calgary, and then there's the Lakeshore Regional Police Service located on the shores of Lesser Slave Lake, and they serve five First Nations. APD investigates visited the Lakeshore and Sutina Police Departments to find out how a provincial police force would affect policing in light of the CHRT ruling. We found police departments doing day-to-day -day policing in often challenging environments, but they were doing it differently. And they, like the community of Mastuayash, are doing it with less money. And we also found out that the First Nation policing program doesn't just discriminate in funding, but it also limits the kind of police work they do beyond what they call core policing. Core policing is on-the-ground police work, responding to calls, doing traffic stops, and most investigations. More specialized work isn't funded. In defending the land, we find out what the impact of these limitations is. All right, thanks for that, John. That's all we have for you tonight. You can check out our website, aptnnews.ca, for more Indigenous news. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us, and have a great night.